Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Shahnaz. Welcome to hashtag what the patriarchy, my YouTube channel where we work on uprooting the patriarchy through Islamic feminism. Thank you for being here. I did an episode a few months ago or a couple of months ago with Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini on her latest book, Journeys Toward Gender Equality in Islam. And I promised in there that I have a conversation slash interview with her coming up soon. And this video is going to provide that interview to you. This discussion was originally hosted for the New Books Network podcast, specifically the channel New Books in Islamic Studies, for which I am one of the hosts. And I will provide a link to that in the description of this video. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Hi, Ziba. Thank you so, so much for joining me today to talk about your wonderful new book, Journeys Toward Gender Equality in Islam, in which you have conversations with several very important scholars of our time. It's an excellent book that is that I find very hopeful uh, and also distressing at times, given the kinds of uh, challenges that some of the scholars face. But thank you for the book, and I'm so glad that it exists. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to talk about it. Absolutely. Um, before we get to the content of the book, we like for our uh, listeners to hear about who you are and the kind of work that you do so that in case somebody's not familiar with you, can get to know you a little bit better. So can you tell us about who you are? And as a question that you ask your uh, interlocutors here, talk about your intellectual journey with yes. us. Yes, my inter intellectual journey is very much tied to the Iranian revolution in 1979 which was an absolute, um, I think it was one of the most important events, at least in many people's life, in my life, which really formed both my personal and intellectual life. And I did my PhD in anthropology, social anthropology. In, uh, and by the time I finished, which was 1980, uh, it became history because I worked in four villages in Iran and things had changed so much. And then I became interested in uh, Islamic uh, law. And it's also, as I say in the book, it is a personal um, matter for me as well, because uh, after the Iranian revolution, family laws were changed and women lost all the uh, legal rights that they had for child custody and divorce and all this sort of thing. And after the revolution, I also came to experience a different face of my faith, Islam. So it all came as a absolute shock and, <laughs> and also painful because I tried to understand, understand what is happening. And when my ma previous marriage broke down, I realized that I have no right to divorce. And it was then that I started studying fiqh, and that started in 1984. And since then, you know, I've been really fascinated by Islamic jurisprudence. And uh, my work has been somehow like a legal anthropologist. And I've been working on Muslim family laws. In 1980s, I did field work in Iran and Morocco. And the main questions that I asked at the time for me were, what does it mean to be married and divorced under Islamic law? Where is the place of sacred in the law? And it's basically about understanding marriage and divorce. And what I learned was that by the time that a marriage breaks down, it is like any other human relationship anywhere. And so everything that is sacred just evaporates. And women are really treated as a second class citizens. And uh, then in 1990s, uh, I became inter interested in construction of gender in Islamic legal tradition. And basically when we say legal tradition, we are talking about Islamic rulings. And I did field work in Qom, which is a center of religious learning in Iran. And uh, it resulted, the first one resulted in my first book, which is Marriage on Trial, a comparative study of family law in Iran and uh, Morocco. And the second one is Islam and gender contemporary debates with the ulama in Iran. 
And what I did for the second field work was basically I tried to understand how these ideas of gender come about, because certainly they do not come from uh, text itself. They are not divine. They are humanly uh, human construction and they're constructed by men, by ulama. And so it was basically conversations with them, with the ulama. And I also started studying fiqh in 1990s with a cleric and he introduced me to Qom. And that was the result of my second book. And uh, then in 90, while I was writing this book, I also became involved in making Divorce Iranian Style, which is a documentary inspired by my first book. And I worked with Kim Longinato, who is a fantastic documentary maker. And uh, doing uh, working with Kim and also going to the courts and talking to women and also the, being there uh, was really, really inspiring for me and also painful. And the film, as you know, was successful and uh, it opened different doors for me. And I think that also was the passage for me to go from scholarship to activism, but because I came to realize the impact of films. And, uh, and in, uh, in early 2000, I became involved uh, wo working with Sisters in Islam, which is the first women's group uh, that, wo uh, that came into um, existence that worked within Islamic and human rights framework. And I must say that after I finished my field work in Qom, and while I was doing this field work, I was really, really becoming interested in what came to be called Islamic feminism, and which is a new consciousness, new way of knowing, and a new knowledge from within Islamic uh, framework. And um, uh, working with Zaina Anwar in Sisters in Islam, uh, led to the creation of Musawa, and I'm one of uh, a founding member of Musawa. And uh, I, I would say since 2009, uh, when I started this book, um, it's it's my work really intensely been um, involved, or I I see it as a contribution to the creation of feminist knowledge from within Islamic framework. That's wonderful. I was just telling you, I am in complete awe of your work, of your journey. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading uh, the chapter in which you talk about your own journey. And I've, I've assigned your books in my classes. I have always, always loved and appreciated your commitment. And I, and I find it so inspiring that you insist on working from within the Islamic tradition, you, your insistence on the difference between fiqh and sharia, which I think you may have been the first person to point that out in a way that I understood. And I found that so incredibly liberating. And I'm always surprised that people don't know that. And I, I don't know why it's not a bigger deal that there's such a big difference. And uh, although clearly not all of the uh, folks that you talk with uh, agree with you on that, but I, I think there is an, an important difference. And Although even those like um, um, Abdullahi Ahmed and Naim, even though he disagrees with you, I think that the way that he then ends up defining and, under and explaining to you, I'm like, wait, you're on the same page. <laughs> you're saying the exact yeah, same thing yeah. that Shifa's saying. So it was really fascinating. But all of that to say, I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm so grateful for your work and I'm so grateful that you thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you. I, uh, this is really heartening to hear. Uh, you know the um, distinction between fiqh and uh, sharia. When I did field work in Iran and Morocco in 1990s, and in my first book, Marriage and Trial, I do not make that distinction. Because what I did in that book was not focusing neither on fiqh, neither on um, legislation, but on women's strategy and the court cases. And both the judges and everybody who came to the court were talking about the sharia, sharia law and nobody talked about fair. So I, I noticed 
in the foot, uh, footnote. But in 1990s, when I started my conversation and debates with the ulama in Iran, I realized without this distinction, there is no way to have a conversation. Because um, it is important to separate the legal from the sacred. Separate the legal from the interpretations of the sacred. And um, I think this is the field work really in Rome uh, taught me the importance of this and the very fact that the distinction between the two are completely distorted when people talk about it and also um, when some scholars write about it as well uh, and I, I agree with you I think it is an important distinction and because why because it gives us a language and also, it gives us a way of challenging from within. And uh, without this distinction, it is almost impossible. That is why I think mm -hmm. people are uncomfortable with it. And you know, one, one thing that I wanted to do uh, in this book that I hope uh, it will come across and you should tell me is that to show that uh, how we come to know what we know. Yes. Especially how we come to know what we know about Islam. Because it is like a journey and our experience is as important part of that journey. So experience is a source of knowledge. Is a, I see it as a source of theological knowledge because it who we are and how we evolve also uh, impacts our relationship with divine and also it impacts our relationship with the notions that are so central to Islam, justice, fairness, the human dignity and all this. Mohsen Kadibar, you know, started as a total believer in Islamic Republic and then gradually he evolved. Now, I wouldn't say he evolved, he came to a different understanding. And what he did before was so important because he has such an important grounding in Islamic uh, traditional fiqh. And that is what enables him to build on it. And also he and almost all the people that I talked to, uh, apart from, uh, um, uh, I would say, Asma Lam Robert, uh, they have religious learning. But Asma Lam Robert, her, her approach to religion came with spirituality. It didn't come from law. So it came from a secular part to um, uh, Islamic feminism. So they have different journeys. And we also disagree on certain things, which I love that because it's so important. I think disagreement is the source of um, uh, the source of moving, moving ahead and progressing. Because if you agree with, with each other, you know, uh, all the time, nothing will come new. It's a very creative process. And, uh, but there are certain premises that we all agree. And I think these premises are very important. And I see them as the benchmarks for construction of an egalitarian gender relationship with an Islamic framework. One of the one of the things that I found so inspiring in their in, in these conversations was the each of their commitments to Islam, right? This idea uh, to mm. God. God is at the center of their um, of their beliefs of their as as they change their views and as their opinions develop with time. God and Islam remain the central uh, sort of the, the, the central uh, points in their uh, in, in their beliefs and, and and we can see also as I uh, forget who I think it was Khalid Abul Fadl um, in the chapter with him. Uh, when he's talking about his journey and how Yusuf al-Qaradawi, for example, you know, these folks become more corrupted. They end up taking different positions uh, because they get paid a lot by Saudi, the Saudi government, yes, yeah. for example, right? But yeah. the, the ethical commitment, mm -hmm. and, and this is something that I find in, in my research on um, when I'm talking to Muslim women who are married to or mm. non-Muslims, the one, this is the one thing that they are insisting on God. 
Islam, this is what this is what matters. What is Islam telling us? What is God telling us? What is ethical? What is right? And instead, what, and this is why I think fiqh is so problematic, right? It may have worked for some time, I don't know, but it definitely needs to be evolved because we as humans, our ideas are changing and we have the different moral compass today and ethics needs to be, it needs to stay at the center of uh, any changes that we want in for, from an Islamic perspective. So I, the, their commitment to Islam was just so incredibly beautiful and hopeful. Yes, yes, yes. And it's something, and fiqh was, um, you know, fiqh is absolutely sophisticated um, oh, yeah. Islamic uh, and, um, law. And it's one of the more sophisticated. But what happened, I think, a lot to do with the uh, but, uh, with the um, legacy of colonialism, with the experience, uh, Muslims' experience of colonialism, and also the decline, and more than anything, the authoritarianism that closed the door to asking questions, the door to challenging. And so with authoritarianism within any system, uh, decline is bound to happen. And so what we have as a fiqh is really, to me, uh, belongs to at least 200 years ago. And, and it has not evolved. And it needs to evolve. No, but the, the centers of religious learning are so resistant. And this comes across in chapter with um, Esma Lam Robert. Yes. Yes. And one of the conversations that I have with, um, or disagreements that I had with Abdullahi Al Naim was uh, the importance for me to work with the centers of re religious learning, with the traditional, those who work within a traditional framework. And with the clerics as well. And he was saying, no, there is no way that you can work because you know they have vested interests and also they have no room for uh, uh, ideas, uh, new ideas, they don't allow challenge. And at that time, you know, he was the first person with whom I had the conversation in 2000, September 2009. Then in chapter with I mean, um, chapter with um, Asma Lambrobet, we see that Asma Lambrobet tried so hard. She is the first woman who is the director of the first women's studies in Rabat and Muhammadiyya, which is the biggest network of ulama in Morocco. Uh, but at the end of it, after many years, she is forced to resign, and she resigned basically over the dispute over one thing that she said that quran gives equal rights to men and women in terms of inheritance and gender equality in inheritance is quranic and they just wanted her to take it back and that was the ulama wanted her to take it back and she didn't so she had to resign that was heartbreaking for me. Was it, um, who was the, the person that she'd been working with and who seemed to have been supporting her all this time? Was it Abadi? Yes, uh, yes, Dr. He Abadi. Was, Dr. Abadi was helping. I mean, he was so supportive all of that time. And then in that one moment when he's like, you need to take it back because this is what the newspapers are saying. And she's like, I'm not, I'm not gonna take it back. The, the, the headlines were sensationalized and, and that wasn't fair, but she was like, I'm not taking the content back. and. Then she had to resign, and then they actually, and then the the language they used for when she was replaced, right? Somebody who loves our tradition and Sharia, and and I just, I I wanted to cry for her. I want to cry for the for those of us who are trying so hard to work within these institutions and within a religious framework. And there's this there, there's this insistence coming from the ulama from these religious institutions that nope, justice is not inherent to Islam, right? Gender justice is not an Islamic ideal, and that is disturbing to me yes but you can understand why dr abadi had to give in because you know all these ulama from all over morocco came together and said that we can't have her there and his compromise was for her to take it back but for her to take back that there is no gender equality in the quran when it comes to inheritance was really going against her belief. I mean, it, like I understand the political pressure on him to, to you know, for her to, to resign. But then the language of something like, you know, the 
uh, when she was when she was replaced with yes. someone else that i just found so problematic because the assumption the idea being oh she doesn't love our tradition or she doesn't love islam or she doesn't love sharia that just was i i i thought that was uh, a betrayal and and, yes. and and that sense yes. of betrayal keeps coming through in in the cases of so many of these individuals so many of these brilliant scholars who are trying so desperately so hard right there um i, I mean they go to prisons these they become political prisoners yeah. in some cases and i i mean this is embarrassing in the 20 in the year 2020 or now it's 2020 and the interviews are much older but to be asking for these very basic things like gender equality like in equality and inheritance like not having to not being forced to cover our heads these are such basic things and it is just embarrassing to be talking to to still be fighting for you know rights when it comes to those issues in the in in the 21st century yes but i at the same time i also see that um, you know that language in asma lamrab for asma lamrab for her successor was the language that we have won the traditionalists have won so perhaps or not perhaps definitely they won a battle but definitely not the war <laughs> i see this really as stages because with everything uh, you know what um, asma lambrava did the way that she stood up and uh, not denied uh, her faith because i don't see any clear distinction between secular and religious spaces right. they are very much interconnected interconnected mm -hmm. and what she did actually the secularist feminists who were so much opposing her realized that she's like them she believes in equality and somehow you know change the balance i always try to go to, to look at the uh, bright side because for me hope is important hope is like faith that's what i'm uh, saying that's what i love about it. <laughs> this is what i love about your work and about you and I, I really cannot afford to lose um, uh, hope. And I, I feel that both hope and faith are the things that we choose. It's a commitment that we make. Yes, it is despairing, and I despair many times, but then I continue. But I, I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my journey as well on this because uh, there are the young generation coming and there are people like you. And believe me, in 1990s, early 1990s, uh, when I started writing about Islamic feminism, it was seen as a contradiction in terms and nobody really accepted it. And I remember that in 1990s, I used, after, you know, uh, getting to know about Sister in Islam and also women in Iran, especially Zanon magazine, mm -hmm. I was really enthusiastic. I, w I wanted their voices, their way of thinking to be heard. And I used to write articles and submit it to journals. I tell you, all of them were rejected. Mm -hmm. And why? Because, I, I, because, you know, those who read your article are your peers and they can pick a hole in your argument or um, in the fact or whatever and, and reject it. And at the same time, at that time, the feminist journals, uh, they, ha they had no specialists. You know, the Islamic feminism as a discourse did not exist. And these days it is, it is actually more difficult to reject articles like that because there is a literature there. I want to talk about, um, oh, let's talk about Amina Wadud and her journey. I, I mean, yes. you know, I, one theme that keeps coming, that kept coming up in here was the way, and, and you mentioned this in your own introduction, also the personal experiences, the political experiences, the um, cultural experiences that, that inform our journey, that, that inform our conclusions and our relationships with Islam and with, uh, you know, with an Islamic feminist framework for gender justice. And Amina Wadud's case is just especially uh, beautiful and different because she's she's coming as a convert to this to the to the tradition, and then her experiences in different parts of the world. But yeah, what how did how did that conversation go? And I um, would just love to hear more about Amina Wadud and her journey and anything you can share with us for our listeners. 
Yes, I I met Amina Badud. I of course I had read her work and admired her and I met her first time in 2000 in Malaysia when Sisters and Islam had a meeting. And as you know she is one of the founding member of Sisters and Islam and she went to Malaysia in 1988 and um, for 4 years. So at the time, when we, we used to have a lot of conversation about uh, feminism, because if you remember at the beginning of at the preface of her book, um, it's uh, Women, Women and Quran, she basically says that she is not a feminist, she's been called feminist, and given that identity, she is both pro-faith and pro-feminism. And I really could see what she was doing was so feminist, so why she didn't want that identity? So we used to have this conversation quite a lot in early 2000 and all this. And um, I find her work extraordinarily important. And I think she is one of the, um, she's one of the best uh, theologian that we have in Islam and her relationship to God and her, the way that she um, really, um, breaking the ground and breaking taboos are very important. And I see her act as doing the prayer, public prayer in um, New York, really, really as breaking a taboo. And that is important because it is actually talking about the presence of women in the ritual space as a leader, as a leader of the prayer or as an imam. And as you, you see, you know, the way that the prayer, it, it took her many years because the first um, khutbah that she did was in South Africa, 12 years earlier. It took her 12 years to accept to do this prayer because she wanted to be clear with herself that is she doing it for her ego or is this doing it for uh, her faith or whatever, but when she decided she was clear. But those who were organizing it, they had their own agenda and you can see this. And um, Amina Badud, um, of course, as you will, uh, you know that she was really, really hurt by that reaction. And it is very hurtful and still continuing, but she had also good support. And I think she did a very important work. And as you see in the book, what really is interesting that when Musawa was born at the launch of Musawa, it was there and then that she felt that she belonged to Islamic feminism because she felt there is a community. And you can understand as an, an African Muslim not living under Islamic law and also her um, her Islam, her understanding on Islam is quite different from some of the American Muslims. Yeah. Uh, very progressive, very different. I, I don't like to use the word progressive, very different, very spiritual, and mm -hmm. also very egalitarian. There's a, when she's talking about her experience in Egypt um, at uh, in University of Cairo, where she's, she's meeting with um, scholars to read the Quran and the, the moment when she realizes, whoa, how does how does meaning making work? How do you know this stuff? I which I just thought was so powerful. I'm going to read that where she says, yes. um, when we read the verse in the Quran that said, do not force your girls, meaning slave girls against their will. He told me that it meant don't put them into prostitution, but you can have as much sex with them as you want because they belong to you. I said, what? Not just not just what, but how do you come to know that conclusion? When the words just say don't force them if they don't want uh, i don't understand how it means you can do what what you want isn't that forced to and i just i find that moment so powerful because this is exactly these are the kinds of questions we should always be asking how do we find how do how do we know how, why are we adding more words there and yes um, and that is the realization that yes. she had at that very moment mm -hmm. and, and 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 many of us have this realization you know, at certain moment that we realize, why? Who says this? Exactly. 
Let's talk about um, the the person that I um, said I had never heard of, uh, Sadiqa yeah. Osmaki. So she's, I mean, she was brand new to me. I her experiences in you know in in working in these in, uh, religious institutions and learning in these institutions. And when she talks about how the challenges and the the kinds of impositions that the and, and the sexism and all of that, um, very enlightening and nothing surprising there because sort of in a way it's it's as if. Now we know this is the case, but it's as if the systems are set up in a way, the institutions are set up in a way that just discriminate against women, and then we don't end up learning in these institutions, and then that's held against us. It's like the system sets us up. Again, she's she's another of the uh, of the scholars that you talk with who is punished, penalized for her uh, views and her uh, her experiences and so on. And again, as we see the common theme throughout all of their journeys, the commitment to Islam. I, I love this. I, I love God. I'm not going to give this up. Tell us a little bit about her, because uh, I imagine that a lot of our audiences might know her, might not know her. How did you come come to know her? What is uh, what what is she working on that our readers could our listeners could uh, benefit from? Her work has not been much known in English because it was not translated. And there is also this is another barrier. You know, there is so much good work in Arabic, in Persian, in, in Urdu, in so many other languages which are not really translated. So the, the work of translation is very, to me is very much important. Only one of her books was uh, translated. So I came to know about her in 2009. And uh, she published her second book, which is uh, basically um, about the capacity of fiqh and whether the fiqh should rule and uh, govern every aspect of our life uh, was self-published. And when I read that book, I was really, really in awe because this is the first time that I have come across a woman in Iran who speaks in that language. Because the reformist in Iran are almost all men. And she's uh, the only one that has emerged and she's now recognized. And then I met her and she's such a brave person. And she comes from a traditional religious family, but she comes from a family that is not um, married to political Islam, does not want to politicize religion. So it is a very strong yearning in her to understand God. And when she is 14, she goes and buy books and buys a copy of the Quran and also Natural Balaqa, which are uh, Imam Ali's book, and tries to understand. And she's a bright student and everybody expects her to do architecture. Another thing, she decides to go to religious studies and uh, universities are cl closed in 1979, uh, 70, um, no, no, 1980, and then she goes to a seminary. And the way that she talks about the restriction in those seminaries, you know, it is just, you see that it's about killing the spirit. And I myself, I would say, I became an Islamic feminist when I was doing field work in Qom, because I, I could see, you know, all the time I was wearing a chador, all the time, I, and I spent a lot of time in uh, women, women's spaces, female spaces in the mosque, and also in um, the shrine. And I could see, you know, how women are mistreated and how they are really um, excluded from the religious spaces. And, uh, and at the time that I did field work in Rome, none of the women who were studying in seminaries were prepared to talk to me or were teaching there because they saw me as a foreign uh, influence because I was part of my education was in England. So I had no idea that somebody like her exists. And I was fascinated. And uh, then her latest book came. Uh, which is called Bas Khani Shariat, rethinking or rereading uh, Sharia. And what she does in that book, I found it fascinating. She uses the methodology of Usul al Fiqh, the very methodology through which the ulama created all these rulings in order to challenge these rulings. 
and basically to show that none of the uh, rulings that come under the Ma'amelat can be justified on the basis of the Quran or on the basis of the Prophet's tradition. So it is an engagement and it's a conversation. So my first question to her was that how come that you use a methodology that fiqh is built and then you want to challenge it because if you follow that methodology, you are bound to come to the same conclusions because it's a circular uh, system. And she said, no, the fact is that there were many who did not come to this uh, con uh, conclusions that majority Fokaha came, but there were voices of minority and their voices become, did not become majority. So it is important that within that system, there is room for change. And I think what stops it is uh, the question of, or the fear of losing their fate and losing their power and influence. So it, it's, it's really very much tied to power and authority. That's what I think too. I think it is about losing power and authority. And, and again, that, th that, that theme is so prominent throughout in, in, in these scholars journeys and why they end up leaving the positions that they're in or why they move to a different country and so on. So um, also I loved her idea of the prophet's sharia, right? The commitment for most of them to the difference between what is sharia, what is fiqh and why, when and how and why we need to change our opinions. Uh, Mohsen Kadivars, for example, I loved his idea of Islami Rahmani, so compassionate yes. Islam, merciful Islam, oh, so beautiful. When he has these four criteria of justice, um, justice uh, reasonability, morality, and effectiveness, uh, I think other scholars talk about the maqasid al-sharia, like we agree that these are the principles of Islam, but somehow when it comes to gender, just, gender injustice, that's also a, a principle of Islam, and that doesn't get to change with time, and conveniently, one of the things that so many of these contemporary scholars are refusing to change their views on is gender, gender and sexual justice, right? Everything else, our ideas on worship have changed, politics, of course, economics, but when it comes to gender justice, and this is the question that I was asking in my dissertation research, right? Like, why are we not changing our positions on so many gender issues? And I mean, it's really ultimately about privilege and what's at stake in these, the, the folks who are making these decisions are... Uh, you know, are going to lose so much privilege. That's really what it is. Yes, yeah, it's privilege. And also what is uh, worse is justifying it. That justification is uh, that needs to be challenged. And I think it has to do with their socializations. But one thing that I really, really uh, noticed in Iran, because in Iran, you know, the clerics are in power. In power. They have been in power for over 40 years. But um, they, what uh, is happening, you see that the society changing and evolving and moving and challenging them constantly. And some of them change and some of them who do not change become more and more conservative. Why? Because that is the way of keeping the power. And in every system, you know, when authoritarianism comes, gender control over women and sexuality is the first step. Another thing that we didn't talk about was about Khaled Abul Fazal, about his, his journey and also the role of, you know, he gets his ethics from his mother and his education, religious education from his mother, the role of his mother in his life as a, um, as a voice of conscious, even after he's, she's dead, that, that voice is there, calling him Shay Khaled. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and and I, I was so touched by that. Mm -hmm. And also the role of his wife, Grace. And the way that Grace um, is also enabling as well, because she is a convert to Islam and she converted to Islam before meeting Khaled Abu Fazl or even knowing about him. And she's also as a convert is so frustrated mm -hmm. with all this um, uh, ways that the converts are 
educated or introduced into Islam. And when she hears one of his lectures in 1999, or earlier, you know, that's the beginning of change and it's a partnership. So I didn't know these things about Khaled Abu Fazl. So when I went into his house for the interview and met um, his wife and all the dogs that they have, it really opened another side of it, which is yeah. really, really very human. I, and now I, they have this Usuli Foundation, which is an independent and and somehow he is recreating that ambience of learning that he had in Cairo. Halaka. You know when I uh, when I when I first started my journey um, towards Islamic feminism and I was reading um, all of the all of the scholarship, I came across his book uh, speaking in God's name, and I well, I loved it, and I I wrote to him, and he's one of the first scholars who responded in such a humble and beautiful way. And since then, I have expressed disagreements with him publicly and with Brace publicly on on some Facebook groups. And his willingness to still support me, I asked him for recommendation letters a couple of years ago for something, and he graciously accepted. Um, and and that comes through his conversations with you here, right? His because again, for him, it's a commitment of. A commitment to learning, commitment to growth, yes. commitment to Islam, to ethics, and 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 Grace is, uh, I think, when, when they're talking about when Grace also like chimes in and um, it tells you more about their uh, like his relationship with his mom and <laughs> how his mom is remains like this huge influence in his life, and she's like. You know, when Grace is saying something like she's she gets into these debates online, even about basic stuff like hijab and dogs and con poor converts, they get told it's haram to have dogs and they have these sad, tragic stories of getting rid of their dogs that they love just because they became Muslim. Because because what's happening here is compassion, right? If you don't, if your Islam is not founded on compassion, then of course you have no respect for animals. And of course you don't respect yeah. dogs and you think that they're a curse and, and, and so on. So yeah. I, thoroughly enjoyed that conversation with him also and and then yeah we can I guess if we can end with a sort of um, this idea of the future right what you think the future might be like how hopeful you are still uh, what message you would like to send out to the younger generation of Muslim feminists and activists who are working on these issues and yeah the message is that um, it is important you know to to understand our tradition and also it, it is important to bring our tradition, Islam, in conversation with other traditions and with other branches of uh, knowledge. And I believe in conversation and gradual change. And uh, one thing that we didn't talk about is Musawa and also the journey to Musawa, because I, I feel that Musawa is very important in a way that it is, the, one of the few organizations that bring scholarship and activism together and producing knowledge from within. And um, its birth, you know, its creation at a global level was, a, to me, is an important event. So I'm hopeful and I'm, what gives me hope is the young generation because they don't have the baggages that my generation had, the dichotomy between religion and uh, human rights and feminism and secularism, and also their commitment to justice um, is, is really overwhelming and nice. One thing that I saw recently on the Facebook page from Musawa was, I think it was a more accessible version of Men in Charge, right? It is one of the most important books I've ever read in my life, one of the most powerful, one of the most hopeful books that I've ever read in my life, and it's an excellent tool for challenging Right, like the patriarchy using Islam itself. Oh, one last question that we like to ask our authors is what you're working on currently that we can look forward to in the near future. In Mosavo, we have just finished one phase of a project that we started in 2018, and it is called Ad and Ihsan in Muslim Marriages Towards Egalitarian Ethics and Laws. And it's, it's actually built on the work that we had done for challenging Kawama and Velaya, male authority over women. And uh, the focus is on marriage and the focus is on ethics as well. 
ethics, um, because without egalitarian and just ethics, it is impossible to have just laws. And the dominant ethics that we have in Muslim legal tradition are still patriarchal. There are ethics that speak, do not speak to our values of the time and conception of justice and the realities on the ground. The first phase of this project was uh, working with the scholars and um, having conversation with them and having conversation among, they having conversation among them and with activists. So the book uh, that is called um, uh, Justice and Beauty in Muslim Marriages Towards Egalitarian Ethics and Law is now completed and it is in print and it will come out in November. And what we have done is that simultaneously uh, we are making it available in Arabic. So it is translated into Arabic and we have a wonderful, wonderful um, translator uh, because translating from English into Arabic and this concept is not easy. And her name is Randa, Dr. Randa Abu Bakr, who teaches at Cairo University. And she's the one who also translated Men in Charge into Arabic. Both of them hopefully coming out in November. And the second phase of the project, which is empirical, what, what we always call it empirical or ethnographic side of it, because um, how this, um, it's important for, for us, it was important to understand where, what is the place of this two concepts of Qawama and Wilaya in everyday life of women. So we focus on case histories. And this time we want to be more ambitious and do solid comparative research in uh, at least four countries and also open the conversation for change. And I myself want to work on marriage contracts because I have always worked on marriage contracts, but now I want to work on it. And uh, from a different, because uh, when I started working on it, uh, all this knowledge was not there. I'm talking about 1980s. Uh, but now I, I really want to go back to it. You know, I, they're looking, Muslim women are looking for egalitarian uh, marriage contracts. And there are some templates online. And I know other folks are working on a similar sort of uh, similar question of what ex how to make the marriage contract more egalitarian and so on. So I, I cannot wait for that. Please, please keep me informed and let me know how, let me know how that comes out. And I will. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Ziva. This was wonderful. I, I hope that you enjoyed your uh, enjoyed it as well. I know that my audience will definitely enjoy this conversation. Thank you. And thank you for your generosity and your nice questions. Absolutely.